it's a it's great to be back and it's really super great to be back in order to introduce doctors jennifer blesh and annalise stratton dr blesh actually came to tufts a few years ago and gave a talk in in the biology department and her work really is at the junction of sort of the basic sciences and applied sciences thinking about how to link human activities with biological processes in, in agroecological systems. She's a, an associate professor at the University of Michigan and has worked in both um, the Midwest and in Brazil. That has been a little bit more difficult during COVID times, but she looks forward to returning to that, but, and they'll be presenting some of that work. Dr. Stratton um, is completed her PhD under uh, Dr. Blesch's um, guidance and is now a research associate in environmental geography at Vrije University in the Netherlands. So exciting to, um, to, to see her career blossom. I should mention that Annalise was a Tufts, is a Tufts jumbo, and she was the first ever environmental studies student to complete a senior thesis. That work, she didn't just leave it behind, she continued to sort of develop some of the ideas from her thesis working along with Dr. Blesch and another colleague at Northeastern, and they published that work last year. So she's, uh, she's, she's really made great um, use of her, 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 her work around the globe. That work was based in her work in Guatemala. So to the topic of their talk, there's just general agreement that diversified agricultural systems are really desirable and can lead to greater environmental sustainability. But there are so many forces that make the implementation of these side of ideas difficult. I can remember a former student once telling me um, she grew up on a farm and she would come back with all these ideas that she had learned in the classroom. And the reaction of her parents was often, that's just not practical. We can't do that. So how do we engage farmers to support the need for transitions? And I don't want to give away their story, but their research is showing us a way and I'm super excited to have them present today. Welcome back to Tufts, both of you. Thanks so much, Colin. All right. Wonderful. All right. Well, hello. And welcome to everyone listening live from Tufts and elsewhere around the globe. Thank you to Colin, uh, to Alex Blanchett, who isn't here today, but uh, thanks to him as well, and to Coco uh, Gomez for inviting us to give this talk and as well um, for the warm welcome. As a Tufts alumna, I'm really excited to be returning today to share with you a slice of my PhD research uh, within a broader food systems framework, as well as to be presenting jointly with my doctoral advisor, Jennifer Blush. And I'm calling in today from Amsterdam, where I'm currently doing postdoctoral research uh, on agricultural diversification in a European context at Vrije University, as Colin mentioned. Without further ado, I'll get started. So we hear a lot of horror stories about the food system these days, and rightly so. Uh, across the globe, food systems focused on commodity crop production have contributed to a host of crises over the past 50 years. We hear narratives like these about farmer debt, greenhouse gas emissions from soil degradation and fossil fuel use, and continued inequities in food access, driving simultaneous micronutrient deficiencies and obesity. But in today's presentation, we want to turn this narrative on its head to share stories of hope, of groups of farmers who choose to transition to more sustainable agricultural practices against all odds, and what we can learn from their successes. Frame these narratives with hope, we'll use the concept of agroecology. Agroecology is an evolving and multidimensional concept encompassing a scientific discipline, a suite of farming practices, and a social movement of farmers and consumers who demand a right to food and the means to produce it with autonomy. The research we'll be discussing today falls at the intersection of the science, practice, and movement of agroecology. As a science, agroecology is the application of ecological concepts and principles to the design and management of sustainable food systems. Since all farms are subject to 
ecological principles, we can consider them as agroecosystems. These agroecosystems can be managed using agroecological practices that increase biotic interactions and promote ecological functions like nutrient cycling or organic carbon storage. Examples of agroecological practices include increasing agricultural diversity, reducing tillage, and using legume cover crops as a nitrogen source. Agroecology is also linked to a broader movement for food sovereignty, which supports the right of all people to healthy, culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound methods. In summary, transitions uh, to agroecology or agroecological transitions represent a switch from farming practices reliant on external chemical inputs and low crop diversity like this example from Brazil, which is a conventional tobacco farm, to those that manage increased species diversity to support a broad range of biotic interactions, which contribute to agroecosystem functions. While intensive conventional agriculture uses inputs to maximize production of just a small number of staple crops, agroecological farms aim to maintain crop productivity, but also support other social and ecological goals and farms in transition often fall somewhere in between. So as we've seen, agricultural diversity is an essential component of agroecological transitions. We also know that the benefits of agri agricultural diversity are especially strong when functional diversity also increases in cropping systems. Functional diversity means growing crops and livestock with different traits that complement each other, like annuals and perennials, legumes and grasses, or harvested and non-harvested crops like cover crops. Functional diversity promotes interactions between species, which can lead to greater overall capture of resources like light, water, and soil nutrients. And this can lead to increases in yield and even soil health over time. In addition to the environmental benefits of diversification, uh, evidence also shows that agroecological farming systems increase farmers' access to, to a diverse selection of foods and to markets, both of which can contribute to dietary quality. Several recent scientific reviews have demonstrated that agroecology also leads to positive outcomes for food security and nutrition, especially in low and middle income countries. The effect is particularly strong in more complex agroecological systems, which integrate multiple practices of diversification. And yet, in spite of the many social and ecological benefits I just mentioned, agricultural diversity is declining globally. While trade enables increased access to a variety of food crops in many parts of the world, like in Boston or in Amsterdam, Recent, re recent research has shown that agricultural production is growing increasingly homogenous as farmers simplify their crop rotations on a global scale. So why are farming systems becoming less diverse? I'll turn it over to Jennifer now, and she'll introduce our conceptual framework, which addresses multi-scale constraints to diversified agroecological farming systems and how some farmers are overcoming them against the odds. Great, thanks Annalise. So in our research on agroecology, we increasingly apply this concept of structural constraints to understand agroecological transitions. Over the last 150 years, structural factors related to political and economic forces have promoted simplified large-scale farms around the world. Factors listed here related to political economy, governance, environment, and culture all interact to reinforce this simplification. For instance, concentrated supply chains have moved most production decisions into the private sector, creating social inequities. So together, these structural forces constrain individual farmers' choices or agency in this picture here. And many farmers who seek to adopt agroecology now struggle against the odds. Despite these formidable barriers, there are clusters of farmers around the world who've departed from these global trends to create and reap the benefits of agroecology. We'll describe two case studies today involving the organization Practical Farmers of Iowa and the farmer network Ecovida in Southern Brazil. But there are many examples like urban agriculture movements in North America, zero budget natural farming movement in India, the Soil Food and Healthy Community Organization in Malawi, the National Association of Small Farmers in Cuba, organic coffee systems of Chiapas, Mexico, and many more. 
And these groups promote practices like agroforestry, cover crops, intercropping, habitat conservation, livestock grazing, and varietal diversity. Innovations like these are often first developed by farmers, including building from indigenous practices. And agroecologists do on-farm and participatory research to learn from and with farmers through horizontal knowledge exchange. Through an interdisciplinary collaboration funded by SUSINC, the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, we developed this conceptual framework, which identifies complex interactions between structural and behavioral factors that challenge and facilitate transitions to diversified agroecological farming systems. This figure reflects that farms are complex socio-technical and socio-ecological systems. They're made up of ecosystems, infrastructure, markets, institutions, social norms and behaviors that together shape farm management decisions and then the resulting outcomes. And these interlocking wheels here are intended to show movement, how different constellations of factors related to structure and to the agency of farmers in their communities can align to mobilize resources for diversification. The outer wheel shows those four categories of structural factors that I mentioned earlier, all of which tend to reinforce simplification. A small number of companies control food production and flows and accumulate wealth in the food system and corporate influence over research and development institutions that focus on input dependent monocultures only deepen this trajectory. These structural barriers limit farmers choices. Despite these constraints, the middle turquoise wheel shows the exercise of agency and innovation building on beliefs and actions of farmers and their social networks that can produce clusters of agroecological farms. This individual and collective action in turn can put pressure on existing institutions to change. The framework emphasizes how factors related to agency and structure can align to mobilize resources, which are shown in the inner green wheel that increase the odds of agroecology. Important resources include access to land, capital markets, knowledge and skills, and the infrastructure to plant and harvest diverse and crop and livestock products, things like seeds, equipment, and labor. Finally, the center of the wheel indicates that agroecological functions on farms are governed by crop, livestock, and associated or unplanned diversity across scales. So together, these systems interactions produce outcomes that can range from food insecurity to food security, from unjust to just livelihoods, and from environmental pollution to ecological sustainability. In the next section of the talk, we'll apply this framework to analyze two transformation bright spots, cases in the US Midwest and Southern Brazil. We describe barriers and pathways to agroecology in these two sites that have contrasting farming systems and socioeconomic conditions. We'll then make connections across those two cases to identify mechanisms that facilitate agroecology. So in other words, we're arguing that understanding how agroecology occurs within constrained contexts can shed light on avenues for transformation across the food system. So I'm gonna keep talking for a bit and present our first case, which is in the US Corn Belt. The Corn Belt illustrates how bright spots of agroecology can emerge even within a highly industrialized region. In many sub watersheds here, more than 90% of total land area is planted to either corn or soybeans, while diversified farming systems are rare. My work here started in 2005 when I was a PhD student working with this interdisciplinary team you can see here. And we were studying the problem of nitrate leaching losses from grain farms in the upper basin and the resulting dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So higher nitrogen pollution losses are shown in darker colors here. This example will also draw on my current work as a faculty member at Michigan. Michigan sits on the edge of the Corn Belt. We primarily drain into the Great Lakes watershed. We have greater agricultural diversity than many Corn Belt states, but lower Michigan is similarly dominated by simplified grain systems that also contribute to environmental harms. We hear a lot about toxic algal blooms in Lake Erie um, and other harms that Annalise mentioned at the start. Within this context, a small subset of farmers who are spread throughout the region have increased the functional diversity of their farms. And they use practices that can mitigate environmental impacts of monocultures, things like organic farming, mixed crop and livestock production, rotational grazing, rotations that have continuous cover with cover crops or winter grains. So in our ecological work, 
Um, we've assessed their outcomes and we've found that farms using agroecological practices build soil carbon and retain nitrogen. So on the left here, these are data from a global meta-analysis of crop rotation diversity, showing that perennials and cover crops in rotation build soil organic carbon by 12 and 6% respectively. And on the right, these are data from nitrogen mass balances calculated on working farms in the Corn Belt, showing that farms who rely more on legumes as their source of nitrogen have smaller nitrogen balance or smaller surplus nitrogen, which means lower potential for pollution. In an experiment here in southeastern Michigan on 10 diversified vegetable farms, we quantified new nitrogen inputs from legume nitrogen fixation by the hairy vetch. And across farms, there was this huge range in the amount of nitrogen that vetch supplied, grown in mixture with rye and pink or when it was planted alone in green. So one practical outcome of this research partnership was just sharing information with farmers about the performance of legume cover crops on their farms. But what was also useful about this approach is that we could take advantage of the natural gradients that farms span, in this case, a huge range of soil conditions, to build general understanding of mechanisms that drive different outcomes of diversity. So we identified soil properties that explain this highly variable cover crop growth. For example, very low levels of soil phosphorus correlated with low veg biomass, while soils that had very high fertility had lower rates of vetch nitrogen fixation. This shows the percent of vetch nitrogen that came from the fixation process for vetch that was grown alone and in mixture with rye, with an indicator of soil fertility on the x-axis called particulate organic matter. A larger palm nitrogen pool reflects the ability for microbes in the soil to mineralize or release nitrogen from organic matter. And the take-home point here is just that the legumes self-regulate that vetch nitrogen fixation rates decreased across farms as fertility increased. And this means that farmers can invest less in expensive legume seed and focus on other functional groups of cover crops as their fertility builds. This stabilizing feedback between organic matter and vetch nitrogen fixation also provides a mechanism explaining the findings from that earlier on farm work, where farmers who use legume cover crops for nitrogen have smaller nitrogen surpluses and potential for pollution. So building on example findings like these, we wanted to know, well, why are agroecological practices that are most effective for reducing pollution so rare? Going back to that framework, a convergence of factors has led to extreme agricultural specialization in the Corn Belt. Green Revolution policies and then changes in federal subsidies and insurance in the 1970s encouraged farm consolidation. Regional environmental conditions like flat topography also facilitate crop production and mechanization at large scales. Since 2005, the renewable fuel standards, which encourage ethanol production, have only deepened these trends, along with legal factors like not regulating non-point source pollution and a weakening of antitrust regulations, which has further concentrated input and commodity markets. These institutions have co-evolved with new norms and attitudes about agriculture, like valuing the aesthetics of clean or weed-free monocultures and a competitive culture around high crop yield. Within this industrialized context, a small cluster of farmers dispersed throughout the region has adopted agroecological practices. We also conducted social science work to ask, how do farmers transition to agroecological practices despite these large structural constraints? Using qualitative and quantitative methods with farmers from Iowa and Ohio, we found that factors across scales can align to increase farmers' access to resources for transitions. Farmers reduce the financial risks of transitioning with strategies like reintegrating crops and livestock to increase their market diversity. And they drew on their values and commitments around environmental sustainability. This farm scale innovation involved harnessing off farm resources like new farmer to farmer networks that increase access to information. One of the most important organizations in these transitions was Practical Farmers of Iowa, which formed in 1985. And they facilitate on farm participatory experimentation and knowledge exchange through field days and conferences. At these events, participants share technical information, but they also spread new narratives, 
promoting diversification as a practical way to support agricultural resilience. The organization also supports access to financing, infrastructure, and new markets for agroecological practices. More broadly, some of these farmers obtained organic certification to access price premiums, and others enrolled in Farm Bill Conservation Programs like EQIP, a working lands program that has some, although limited, potential to provide incentives for farm diversity. More recently, we studied a new program called Cover Crop Champions, which was developed by the National Wildlife Federation, and it seeks to spread the practice of cover cropping. The program's design similarly works across scales to increase resources for agroecology. So they train farmers with experience using cover crops in new communication methods that are intended to resonate with late adopters by normalizing cover cropping as a way to build farm resilience to climate change, explained by the farmer champion quoted here. So it's actually riskier to not do these practices. This program supports mentoring relationships among farmers who have more and less experience. And it also blends complementary forms of knowledge. So when applying to the program, potential farmer champions apply jointly with corresponding outreach champions. And these are agricultural professionals like district conservationists who have a lot of outreach experience. At the same time, the organization uses farmers existing connections to networks like Practical Farmers of Iowa to be able to reach a larger audience. Our interview results indicate that this program supports cover crop adoption and that farmer champions who had resources from groups like PFI continued to promote cover crops even after their, informal, their formal involvement with cover crop champions ended. So to summarize, in the US Midwest, the formation of farmer networks was motivated by individual and community values around environmental sustainability. In this region, political economic constraints to agroecology, like government subsidies and concentrated markets, mean that the total number of diversified farms and their ability to influence sustainability at scale is currently limited. But through this network pathway, these farmers have created new organizations and participatory research and are creating social pressure for important, even if still limited, changes within the broader socio-technical system. And this can lead to spillover effects that facilitate transitions for a larger number of farmers. So I'm gonna hand things back to Annalise, who's gonna describe our second case study in Southern Brazil. Oh, you're muted, Annalise. Thank you. <laughs> back and forth. Thanks, Jennifer. When we think of Brazilian agriculture, we often picture scenes like these of Amazon deforestation or endless soy fields in the grasslands of the Sahara. Within our framework, structures such as federal subsidies for commodity export crops and concentrated markets in Brazil, like in the US, contribute to trends of deforestation and agricultural expansion. These patterns contribute to Brazil's identity as an agricultural powerhouse, which again favors more concentration and industrial practices and hinders diversification. Similar scenes likely played out in southern Brazil, which is the site of our second case study, centuries ago, when the majority of the native Atlantic forest was felled in favor of agricultural expansion. The story is not so simple, however. Beginning in the late 1980s, land inequality and recognition of the negative environmental and health effects associated with the, these types of industrial practices led to the formation of the landless workers movement or the MST in Brazil. The MST advocates for agrarian reform and more sustainable forms of agriculture. The election of President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, known as Lula, and the Workers' Party in 2003 created important institutional changes in support of, farm, of both farm diversification and other forms of sustainable agriculture in response to the demands of grassroots movements like the MST. Lula consolidated food security, nutrition, and family farming policies through the Zero Hunger or Fome Cero policy platform. This increased financial incentives and credit access for organic and diversified farms. Changes were implemented through two innovative food procurement programs, the National School Feeding Program or PNI, uh, which offered guaranteed school lunches to children uh, with a lot of requirements for diversified and healthy food, 
and the Food Procurement Program, or PAA, which was more general form of institutional procurement for all government uh, offices. And both of them give contract preference to organic farmers, which creates a sort of government mediated market for organic products. Zero hunger programs provided a supportive policy environment for farmers, uh, which was especially heavily implemented in Southern Brazil. Today, two social movements in Southern Brazil are global models of grassroots change toward improved social equity and diversity in agricultural systems. The first is the MST, which I mentioned earlier, and the second is the farmer network, Ecovida, which was especially important for the context of our research and promotes farm diversification through agroecology. Ecovida is a decentralized network for farmer to farmer agroecological certification. It began in, 2000, in, sorry, in 1998 in two municipalities in the, in the most Southern state of Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul. And since then it's grown to include an estimated 5,000 farms in nearly 200 municipalities across all three states of Southern Brazil. Through participatory certification, farmers hold the accountability and they certify one another, which is a low cost option compared to third party certification offered by companies to farmers, which is what we use in the United States, for example. In Brazil, even better, participatory certification meets the same standards as third party audits for organic, meaning increasing numbers of lower income farmers can gain access to organic markets through this farmer to farmer certification. The primary goal of my dissertation research was to understand the social and ecological outcomes of successful farm transitions within this enabling policy context in southern Brazil. The specific side of my PhD work was in the state of Santa Catarina, shown here, um, where I conducted two years of research in partnership with 15 farms, a Brazilian university, and a local nonprofit called Sapagro. My study design covered three stages of agroecological transition. The first stage included conventional tobacco farms, which I considered to be pre-transition. Next were farms in transition to agroecology, which included farms with zero to five years of certification through the Ecovita network. And the range zero to five is because a lot of research has shown in the past that it takes about five years to start building up soil fertility once the diversification practices are implemented on farms. And then the last stage included agroecological farms with more than five years of experience, uh, which were also certified through Hedge Ecovita or the Ecovita network. While all farms in the study previously grew conventional tobacco, meaning they had a shared uh, farm history, they're all now in the sphere of influence of the farmer network Ecovita, and they have differential uptake of agroecological practices. This shared history enabled a unique agroecological transition gradient approach, which we used in my dissertation, assessing social and ecological outcomes across these three stages of transition. Now I'll highlight results from one chapter of my dissertation to demonstrate how the confluence of innovative food system policies I described earlier and farmer networks for agroecology can contribute to the diversification of agriculture against the odds. We used detailed farmer interviews to understand how farm management practices related to farm labor and income. If you'd like to learn more about this research, feel free to check out our publication. I'll start with a quote from one of the agroecological farmers in our study. I always say that the hardest part is to convert. It's a slow process. Sometimes I say that we worked five or six years just to get a piece of land that we could grow on because when we started, there wasn't any life in the soil. The statement contextualizes the process of agroecological transitions in, in our study region where soils have been degraded by decades of intensive tobacco production and erosion. Building soil fertility through diversification and agroecological practices can be a lengthy process. Moving on to some, some results, um, we evaluated four ecological indicators across the three stages of agroecological transition, which were based on the proportion of farms area under different management practices. There's crop and livestock diversity, continuous soil cover, ecological nutrient management, and ecological pest, pest management. Farms scored anywhere from a zero, meaning it was the least ecological practice, to one, the most ecological practice 
uh, and the averages across the different transition stages are shown here on the y-axis. While farms in transition, oh, as expected, uh, indicators increased across the three transition stages, as you can see here across the board. While farms in transition had similar levels of continuous soil cover and ecological pest management on farms, they hadn't yet achieved the levels of crop and livestock diversity, which we saw on the agroecological farms with more than five years of experience. Several of the farms in transition still managed a few of their fields with inorganic fertilizers or used input substitution approaches rather than more transformative diversification practices to manage nutrients, which led to lower scores for those indicators. Moving to the socioeconomic indicators, we found that mean agricultural income on a per capita basis was comparable across the three transition stages, though median income on agroecological farms was slightly lower, as shown as in, the, in the figure here. When assessing total per capita household income, though, we found that agroecological farms tended to earn more on average than conventional farms. Farmers explain this in three ways. First, as you can see in this quote, Higher crop diversity can also increase income stability on transitioning and agroecological farms, which enables them to better balance their expenses and earnings throughout the year. Second, input costs were dramatically reduced on agroecological farms compared to those on conventional tobacco farms. Since agroecological farms relied on inputs, which were internal to the farm, like manure and compost, instead of buying expensive nitrogen fertilizers or pesticides. And finally, agroecological farms also practiced pluriactivity, which means they sought off-farm work um, or used value-added approaches to supplement their income and maintain autonomy over their farm decisions. So for example, a lot of farms in our sample used agritourism as a way to supplement their income. Our main finding for labor was that agroecological farms worked slightly fewer hours on average compared to conventional farms. This was variable across the farms. Agroecological farms use diversification practices like intercropping, diversified agroforestry systems, and mixed crop livestock systems to reduce their workload. For example, farmers planted cover crops uh, to maintain soil cover and reduce the need for weeding. Both transitioning and agroecological farms also reported higher work quality and improved occupational health since beginning the transition. This was important because concern about health effects of pesticide application was one of the main motivations. Transitions on 80% of farms in our study. Now, returning to this quote from the beginning, though we did identify these positive ecological and social outcomes on agroecological farms, it's important to acknowledge that transitions can take longer than the official two-year organic certification period in Brazil, or three years in the US. In this study, farms in transition also reported increased work difficulty and lower incomes compared to agroecological farms with more than five years of experience, attesting to the challenging nature of, of these transitions, especially on degraded soils. In summary, we conducted a case study of former tobacco farms across an agroecological transition gradient in a supportive context, uh, both socially and politically, of southern Brazil. While farms in the first five years of transition struggled with the increased complexity of management, we found that experienced agroecological farms did achieve win-wins for ecological and socioeconomic outcomes, including higher per capita household income and improved work quality. Now, going back to our conceptual framework, we can see how the supportive policy structure created by the Zero Hunger Program enabled Ecovita the Ecovita Farmer Network, mobilized resources such as training, credit, and new markets for diversified agroecological products, and enabled these types of transformations on, on farms. This combination of structure, agency, and resources ultimately facilitated agroecological transitions with social and ecological co-benefits for farmers in the region, like we saw in, in our study. Zooming further back out, we can see patterns across the US Midwest and Southern Brazil cases. In each case, farmers were up against structural barriers like policies that support commodity crops above diversified agriculture. And these drive diversified production systems. But importantly, these cases also illustrate bright spots and demonstrate replicable pathways 
for transforming systems toward agroecology and sustainability. In each case, groups of farmers are managing diversity from field to landscape scales to, to restore ecological interactions and the associated functions and that, that also promotes their livelihoods and well-being. Together, these case studies demonstrate two main pathways that shift resources to farmer-led innovations and facilitate farming system diversification. In the US, farmers leveraged a network pathway, as we called it, to diversification, which was founded on the environmental values underwriting organic agriculture. Now, the dynamic interactions between farmer networks, changes to farm bill conservation and insurance programs, and development of new markets and supply chains are creating opportunities for a wider group of farmers to diversify their rotations. There's also been a growing influence of consumer demand for organic, local, and sustainably produced food. This is a force that could ultimately pressure the dominant system to transform. The Brazil case exhibits a secondary institutional pathway to diversification shows the potential for state and federal programs to develop new markets and institutional models for food access like school meal programs or institutional procurement that foster diversification for nutritious diets and ecological sustainability through farmer networks. These two pathways operate simultaneously and they can be mutually reinforcing. With that, I'll leave it to Jennifer to share some broader takeaways from our work. Yeah, so just to wrap up, um, we'll end by saying that we think these narratives have wider implications for research and policy going forward. We have strong evidence that bright spots like these can support food security and environmental benefits, but agroecological farms are often overlooked in policy and research programs and they face large barriers to success. Imagine if these farms were supported to the same extent that simplification has been supported. One goal of this framework is to advance robust interdisciplinary assessments of diversified farming systems around the world. Given the rapid pace of global change, we need to understand the social and ecological outcomes of agroecology to determine its potential to help mitigate current environmental crises and social inequities at scale. Our results also highlight the importance of learning from farmers who are innovating against the odds. Their actions provide insights to inform broader change because they allow us to understand how they're challenging the dominant system in which they're embedded. And then finally, a central policy implication is the need to transform public and private investments to shift resources to these bright spots, supporting their expansion and their ability to catalyze food system transformation. So with that, we wanna leave plenty of time for questions. So we'll just end by acknowledging a lot of folks who've contributed to this work, a list of funding sources here. We especially wanna thank the farmer partners in the US and Brazil, members of uh, My Soil and Agroecosystems Lab here, partners in Brazil at Sapagro and at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, as well as the broader succinct pursuit team who worked on the framework that we talked about today. Um, so with that, we will pause there and we'd be I'm excited to, to engage in discussion with all of you. Thanks. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. Um, while we're waiting for um, some questions from the audience, I wanted to just kick off one. I was struck by the notion of institutional policies that can provide preferences to farmers to help them during that transition process. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about whether or not some of those policies could be at the like super local scale, like even you know cities, um, institutions like Tufts, um, state, regional ones like New England. Like, what are you seeing that might be not just relying on federal policies that that could help with these transitions? Um. Yeah, maybe you have other examples, Annalise, but I think you sort of said it all right there, Colin, that that's absolutely right, that given that change at the federal level is rather slow <laughs> and things like the farm. So I think one thing that gives me hope, you know, is that the farm bill negotiations, every time they come around, just get harder and harder and they're, they're more and more stalled. They haven't changed appreciably, but I think that that signals that there's a lot of pressure for them to change but it's slow. And so absolutely um, change at smaller scales is really needed in the interim. And we see a lot of efforts with um, urban agriculture movements, institutional procurement, I think can be a really good 
mechanism for it. So, you know, Annalise's case talked about scaling that really to the national level in Brazil and how that allowed for a broader transition. But here in the US, we have a lot of local efforts for institutional sustainable procurement. I'd like to see those. Um, I feel like in the US, those are often really tightly linked to food security um, goals and not ex as explicitly to environmental sustainability, um, which is part of what's so innovative in Brazil. So I'd like to see that connection made a little more strongly here. I don't know, Annalise, do you have any other examples you can think of? That's a great point. I would just say, um, I think they're already emerging at multiple levels. So one example is uh, local food policy councils. I know there are more and more of those popping up at the county level, at the state level in some cases. I know the state of Washington has one. Um, and these can bring together actors from across the food system to actually strategize and come up with more local solutions that link these different processes from the farm to the consumer. So I think there is a lot of innovation happening uh, in sort of like shorter scale, I guess, shorter scale food chains um, or agri-food networks. You know, there's all this language about this, but um, it's happening all over the world. It's just a question of, can it be integrated kind of at a larger and larger scale so that it gets to the places that are not innovating as fast. Thank you. We have a question um, in the uh, Q&A. Kathy Satin writes, thanks for a great presentation. I'm wondering about the role of cultural, racial, socioeconomic diversity in your model. Does that have a place in the center along with farm, field, and landscape diversity? How does it look within your two case studies? It might help to look at this. There's a lot um, to unpack yes, there. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, absolutely, yes, <laughs> it has an important role, um, and I think part of um, part of where it currently comes in is just the unfortunate. Um, so, it, currently, cultural norms are mostly linked to that structural outer ring, especially in the the U.S. Midwest case, um, where the dominant norms are sort of reinforcing um, simplification and these sort of narratives around uh, lack of wanting to have a lot of you know, like integrating livestock, for example, is extra labor or um, there's norms around high yield or specialization, um, but absolutely that also works both ways. And I pointed out in my case that the Practical Farmers of Iowa and Cover Crop Champions, they're both examples of um, creating new narratives, trying to normalize diversity as a path forward and as a means to resilience. And in some cases as a means to, to social equity, but I would say that in the, um, in the Corn Belt, the, the way you put it here, this just isn't as prominent, right? An attention to sort of racial and socioeconomic diversity. Um, so it's absolutely core to the model. And we recognize that that's um, a key outcome of diversification, but it's not as prominent in all regions, especially those that are most concentrated. Uh, where Annalise is working, <laughs> and you can say more about this, um, there's certainly much more attention to issues around racial equity um, and addressing social inequities through social welfare policies that are intended to reallocate resources. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit more on the Brazil side. Um, so thinking specifically about the region I was working in and even more specifically about the Ecovita network, I actually think these types of um, regional social movements open up a lot of opportunities for pluralism. So something I thought was really inspiring um, I went to a couple of the big Ecovita meetings when I was doing field work, and they have very large push right now for increased equity between men and women in the network, increased racial equity. Um, they even have new kind of catchphrases and slogans that say there's no agroecology uh, without feminism, or there's no agroecology with racism. Um, and so they're trying to be more and more inclusive as they expand and start entering, um, I guess, different regions of Brazil as well, uh, because the South, I didn't talk about this today, but important factor where I was doing my field research is that it's, it was heavily colonized by uh, European immigrants in the 1800s. So it's actually quite, uh, I guess, more racially homogenous than other parts of Brazil. Um, however, there are still, there's still a strong presence of indigenous groups uh, and, and plenty of other, um, people of color in the region. And they're, they're trying really hard right now to integrate them into the network. So 
maybe that's more specific to agroecology as a movement, but I think that's the beauty of, of having this multidimensional concept of agroecology is you can integrate that movement into the science more and more. So yeah. I think, yeah. one quick addition, I mean, I think here in the US, one thing we can think about is, you know, these issues of, of socioeconomic inequity and, and racial inequity are often more prominent in food justice and urban agriculture movements and among urban populations. And I think a key path forward is really bridging these divides between rural and urban movements and interests related to agriculture and finding areas of intersection and not setting it up as an us versus them conversation, but thinking about working together um, to integrate those goals in both places. Thank you so much. We have another question from Aram Sattar. There is a growing movement in native communities to gain control of their food supply and to tap into received wisdom and food growing practices. Do you see any potential linkages between these diverse groups that could help advance common goals? Absolutely, I guess I would say. I need to think a little bit more about the, specif the specifics, but... Um... I mean, I think a lot of agroecological concepts come originally from traditional peoples in many places, uh, especially in the Americas, um, because a lot of the science has been developed in the Americas. And uh, yeah, I guess the concepts originated from traditional practices like milpa, for example. Uh, so in some sense it's integrated, but it's not actually acknowledged. Um, Jennifer, do you have more thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of need to do exactly what you wrote here to tap into this this wisdom. And one of the things that I've thought a lot about in my work is um, sort of the epistemologies that we can learn from from indigenous communities, particularly how the the common sort of nature human binary of Western thought just isn't a thing, right? In many cultures and um, those were just the world, everything is integrated. And that's exactly the type of sort of ontological or epistemological lens that we need um, to think about more sustainable diversified farming systems. Um, and then just, you know, building from that, I think the type of agroecological research that we're aiming to engage in and that a lot of our colleagues are doing really well, you know, that tends to be more inclusive of diverse voices and knowledges and perspectives is also a way to, to try to um, advance and amplify uh, these perspectives that are so central to transformation. So, you know, there's a lot of examples out there of people who are doing the work and um, showing us pathways forward, but um, they don't all have equal power or voice. And so that's an important way that researchers can, can help support those efforts. Thank you. I, I, you know, I, I'm struck by your example from Iowa being in the middle of the Corn Belt. And here you see a transitioning against what seems like all odds. And, and yet here in New England, I, I sort of feel like we're, we're not in the Corn Belt. We're smaller farms in Europe. It's a lot of small farms. I'm wondering if there's evidence of transitions happening faster as the scale of farming goes down on a per farm basis and, and whether you have any hints from your work in, in the Netherlands, Annalise, or knowledge of what's happening in the Northeast. Um, Jennifer. I have a, a couple of thoughts about this. Um, one of them is I know there was a recent study that came out in a high profile journal that evaluated the relationship between farm size and diversity of farms. And so at a global scale, the, the data is clear that small farms tend to be more biodiverse. And I think there are a lot of the structural factors that relate to this. Uh, one of them is that it's quite hard to make it as a small scale monocrop farmer, just because policies have really prioritized high yields and this consolidation of farms. And so it's sort of a, a give and take thing, right? Like the more subsidies go into this, the more likely you are to have quite simplified farms that are at larger and larger scales. Uh, and I think that's one of the major differences between the US and Europe as well, which is uh, they do have a similar kind of subsidy structure um, that especially targets a few commodity crops. But I think uh, at a quicker pace than the US, especially quite recently, they have this farm to fork strategy, which is all about increasing the sustainability of agriculture by 2030. There's gonna be more and more movement to uh, shift some of those subsidies and enable the kind of smaller farmers to, 
I guess, to continue to make it and to not have to, you know, to shut down their operations because of this unequal subsidy structure. Yeah, Europe's a fantastic example of um, sort of using subsidies to support uh, environmental goals or, or historical um, sort of, you know, effort, uh, what am I thinking? I can't think of the word right now, but, uh, you know, historical foods of importance or whatever. Um, but I think there's still tensions internationally. Like if we think about the WTO or international trade agreements, um, those subsidies are still perceived as trade distorting. And so I think we have to think also more broadly or globally about how countries can shift subsidies and reallocate resources, but in ways um, that also uh, address social inequities at larger scales. Um, so that's one comment. And then the other is just thinking about, you know, New England is an interesting case because it lost a lot of its small farms as things intensified in the Midwest, right? Because it, you can no longer be competitive when there's such extreme concentration of resources and subsidies towards um, production at scale. Um, and so there has been a quite a large liter literature that I think is really good on the need for farmers in the middle and um, going back to a slightly larger agricultural workforce um, and farms of more diverse sizes um, in order to achieve these goals. And so, you know, that's a pretty big transformation, but I think New England is potentially well positioned um, to engage in that if there were shifts in, in resources and subsidies that would even the playing field and reduce some of the extreme concentration in input industries and, and markets. Um, I will end with um, a, a last question. You had a quote from a particular farmer, but I would, I would just love to hear you reflect on some of your personal connections to farmers and how they have influenced sort of your perspective, your work in ways that might be, go beyond that quote. Not sure which probably the quote Annalise had maybe, but- um... Yeah, it was the one that was from Brazil. Um. Yeah, well, I would say actually that a huge motivating force behind my dissertation was how inspiring it is to work with these types of farmer networks because it, it's really grassroots. I mean, there's, there's no central organization uh, to the network I was working with and it's all based on dialogue and farmer to farmer knowledge exchange, which in the US, there are a few kind of hotspots of it, but it really feels like, uh, I don't know, it was like a very culturally rich experience um, for me. But beyond that as well, it's, it's also inspiring to see um, more and more women farmers or farmers of color who are participating in these movements and um, actually gaining like quite a bit of leadership within their local communities because they're coming in from a different perspective and perhaps don't have the same, uh, I guess, more traditional expectations about what agriculture is supposed to look like um, or you know, how simplified your farm needs to be or how free of weeds it needs to be. Um, so I guess just seeing, seeing that cultural shift was really beautiful and it made me realize that these things can change. Uh, <laughs> even if you start off as a, you know, a very intensive tobacco farmer, a lot of these people were transforming their whole lives uh, through this process. It's not just the farm that's transforming, it's you know the whole livelihood. When I started working in the Midwest, I was coming at the sort of problem of nitrogen pollution very much from an environmental lens um, and hadn't thought a lot about the social dimension. And I think I knew enough to sort of not intrinsically blame individual farmers, but that was really reinforced when I you know, moved there and started working very closely with a large number of farmers to realize that this is not an all an individual level problem and that farmers do not intentionally want to pour nitrogen <laughs> fertilizer down the river. I mean, that might sound sort of naive, but I think it was an important learning process that, that, that this isn't just sort of bad apples, um, but it's part of this incredibly vast and enormous infrastructure um, and, and brought out this sort of structural perspective in my thinking that it's really systems change that is needed and that decision making is constrained by so many different factors 
Um, and so, yes, there are some farmers who are really incredible and, you know, giving us these sort of examples of how change can occur, but we shouldn't be shocked that it's not 90% of them because that takes uh, such incredible sort of, sort of a constellation of factors working together to allow that to happen. And so to me, that was a really important reality check <laughs> and insight and in sort of thinking about the process of change and how we need to intervene on all different kinds of levels. Well, thank you both so much. And I would you know, invite the audience to give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, God. Um, and people yeah. are saying thank you. Um, and I know there's an audience out there with uh, Dr. Gomez as well. So much appreciated. I wish everybody a great afternoon. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. Thank you both. That was wonderful. Bye. Thanks, everyone. So. We'll, we will be in touch. I, I very much look forward to staying in touch. Um, and, and Jennifer, if you ever want to sort of loop back about anything NSF, happy to chat with you. And, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> you're in the thick of it. I hope your year goes well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both. <laughs> Always good to see you. Bye. Bye-bye.